Hi, and welcome to Webpiano Academy. This uh, is a live talk about uh, Alexander Technique. My name is Antonio Di Giulio, and uh, I am a pianist and music theorist, and I'm the founder of uh, Webpiano Academy, and I am the content creator here. Today, we will talk with pianist Michael Sirio about uh, how to improve piano performance uh, through Alexander Technique. Uh, Michael Sears uh, is a, a Buffalo native, uh, performs regularly as a soloist and uh, as a collaborative pianist throughout Western New York. He's uh, an adjunct faculty member at the University of Buffalo, and uh, he enjoys supporting uh, uh, the career of music performance students uh, through accompanying voice lessons, recitals, uh, juries, uh, and performance coaching. Michael is a certified Alexander Technique teacher who offers workshops to performing artists. He's the music director of the Unity Church at Buffalo, is an active yoga enthusiast and volunteer for the Isha Foundation founded by Sadhguru. He's uh, in the Ethics uh, Committee uh, of Alexander Technique in International and is a co-chair there. And uh, on top of that is uh, uh, part of the board of directors of the Chromatic Club of Buffalo. So let's welcome uh, Michael Sear to this conversation. Let's add him to the stream. Hi. Hi, right, thank you so much, Antonella. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, how, how uh, let, let's say that. So as a pianist, how did you uh, come across the Alexander Technique? So what brought you there? <laughs> So it's kind of a long story. Um, when I was a student uh, at the Eastman School of Music back in the 80s, um, I happened to go to a workshop that they offered uh, with nice. Alexander te teachers. And somebody, um, the Alexander work involves some hands-on work, very <laughs> gentle kind of work. Somebody worked with me for maybe five minutes and then asked me to walk and, and I felt like I had no body. It was, it was a really incredibly uh, confusing kind of experience for me. Um, but I always remembered that experience. Um, but it took me another 25 years before I was able to uh, pursue it uh, further. I mean, life kind of got... It away. always takes us so long to understand things correctly, right? To internalize things. <laughs> Um, so I was very fortunate. I was living in Boston and working at the Berklee College of Music uh, in technology. I was not on the faculty. I was um, managing software development for them. Yeah. And uh, but but I had always continued to perform because I love performing. Right. It's just that I, I I didn't feel like I was good enough to do it professionally. Yeah. Um, I had kind of plateaued. Um, and it didn't matter how many hours I practiced, I, I never got any better. And so I, I just kind of uh, assumed that I had reached my limit. Right. Um, so I, I, I had the good fortune to take a, a group class um, offered at the Boston Conservatory in 2002, so about 20 years ago. Right. And the teacher of that class was a pianist. So that I, I think was also fortunate for me um, and in just a few classes, I began to realize that I was doing a lot of things that I wasn't aware of that were interfering with my ability to perform. Right. And, you know, one of them was I was holding my breath when I played and I, I had no idea I was holding my breath. Right. We, we often do that. So we don't breathe together with the music, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So I got really excited and after the group class, um, I, I began to notice, you know, small improvements in my playing. And so I, because I love to perform so much, I continued taking private lessons. And I did that for about five years. And my playing continued to improve over that time. And so I said, well, you know, I want to train to be an Alexander teacher because this is really incredible. I, I love performing so much. And now I'm able to, you know, play at a, at a much higher level than I thought I was, was right. able to do. And so I'd like to learn to teach it so that I can help other people. Right. And so I, uh, the training uh, program, I had a wonderful teacher in Boston named Tommy Thompson. Mm -hmm. who He's been a teacher for, I think, over 40 years. He's a, 
He's a masterful teacher, so I was very fortunate. We had a very small class, um, and it was like a real immersive experience for three years of just really looking at myself and and looking at my habits. And it's the, the Alexander work is it's not just about um, physical habits; it's your it's your thinking. Mental, you know? yes, yeah. yeah. And and so you know, after those three years, um, I. I I think I got to to be much more of an authentic person, yeah. um, and and so then I I decided well you know now I'm going to be an Alexander teacher. <laughs> uh, life happened again, yeah. and uh, it took me another ten years pretty much to kind of get uh, <laughs> to, to the place where I'm able to now, now offer it. But in that time, I transitioned from software to um, to music full time. I, I, right. I moved to Buffalo uh, six years ago. Um, I, I think I, I, I was at the, your first concert here because I was playing there too, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I was lucky to, to go to UB and have Eric Kubner as a, a teacher who's just amazing. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I got my master's in performance and now, um, you know, I, I'm I'm doing enough kind of accompanying there, and I've got some private students and the church job, and I do some Alexander workshops. So I've I've got a pretty full yeah. kind of uh, career, and I'm 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 happier than I've ever been in my life. Yeah. So I remember reading about the Alexander technique uh, back in, when I was in Italy, and. Um, we had a magazine called Piano Time, and I had a subscription uh, to that. I was a teenager, right? And that was my kind of highlight of the month, right? Piano Time <laughs> was like, oh, I read everything about that, all the exercises. Uh, there was no YouTube, uh, Google didn't exist at that point, or barely. Um, so, and uh, I read about the Alexander Technique, but obviously reading about, you know, Oh, how to be relaxed on the piano and how to do this and this. It's, it's very different than seeing and experiencing uh, um, how, you know, to really kind of uh, uh, apply all those techniques to your own playing. Uh, and I remember reading that and then trying to pay attention to, you know, whatever it was. Uh, 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 described in the in this article this, uh, that uh, I was reading, but uh, it, it was very difficult, right, to do that on your own without any kind of uh, supporting yeah. guide. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I I think um, one of the best ways to learn uh, is to is to do a kind of a group experience first. Right. Yes, um, you know there are uh, unfortunately in this area there aren't a lot of. Uh, teachers, um, yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I know in Toronto there are there are probably Quite a few. Yes. Much, much more. I think uh, I think many people are not even aware about the importance of that. I was uh, doing that exercise uh, of walking, right? <laughs> like walking is uh, having the weight uh, on you know natural weight on your legs with a student. Uh, she was a new student. She was shocked that I was teaching that way because she received a different kind of uh, you know idea about what you know, she had the uh, prior lessons and she had a different kind of idea about how, what kind of uh, means to have a piano lesson right for me piano lesson means that i teach to my students how to naturally bring their weight you know on the keys how to stay relaxed how to relax your shoulders you know and then how to think in sort of way how to meditate before playing a piece all those things um and for her that I wasn't teaching that was like almost shocking, right? And right. I think that's the experience that uh, we, uh, I mean, many people have when they think about piano playing. Oh, but I'm not playing any piece, you know, what are you talking about, right? But I remember when I was, um, when I was a student, I was practicing really many, many, many hours, like eight hours every day regularly. Um, and I had an injury, right? So I had to stop for three months because my, my my way of playing the piano was wrong. I was practicing too long in the wrong way. And uh, I remember that I went to somebody who is specialized in sport medicine and uh, they kind of uh, told me and explained to me that I had to change the way that I was playing the piano if I wanted to continue playing at that level. Um, and remember, at that point that I decided to switch teacher and had to go to somebody who kind of, you know, uh, restarted me uh, in the correct, 
uh, way. So relaxing the fingers, so relaxing the hand, relax your shoulders, so relax your arm, you know, think about that and that. So it was, uh, it was really kind of a very, very interesting uh, to see the change also in my playing, because I could play much faster, um, right? So the notes were faster, but that it didn't uh, take me that much effort then, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and I mean, the Alexander technique is, is really, um, it's not teaching you anything new. It's, it's teaching you what you have to stop doing. You right. know, you, yes. we, we develop all kinds of habits that interfere with our ability to just move beautifully and gracefully. Right. Uh, yes. And, and for me, I've studied with some really great piano teachers, but their ideas about how to go about playing, um, you know, they, 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 they usually don't involve a holistic kind of approach. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The Alexander work really kind of looks at your, your, your mind and your body as one unit and any kind of a movement is a whole body movement. Um, right. So it's really important um, uh, when you know when I'm when I'm uh, playing or when I'm teaching, I want the students to be aware that you know of their contact with the floor, their contact with the bench, right. know where their support is coming from. If if you're sitting and you're not sitting well balanced, so that yep. you can easily move, you're you're it's going to limit your ability to 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 play. Yeah. And so yeah, so can, can you, uh, because I mean, I, I'm not sure, I'm aware about the Alexander technique and you know, how uh, how this started and so on, but uh, could you explain that, you know, how this idea, uh, you know, developed over time and how this method developed? Yeah, so so um, Alexander is, is um, the name of a, um, a man who lived uh, in the late 1800s into about the mid 1900s, and he was an actor. And he kept losing his voice, and so he, he would lose money um, yeah. because he would lose his voice. And so uh, he, he went to doctors, and they couldn't find anything wrong with his voice. So he decided that he was going to just study himself. And so he spent many hours with mirrors just kind of looking at what he was doing when he went to speak. And he noticed a, a, a habit that he had that he wasn't aware of. And, and the thing that he learned is that even though he discovered the habit, it was really hard for him not to do it. So a, a lot of the Alexander work is ideas about, first of all, discovering what the habits are mm -hmm. that you're doing, and then some, some techniques for how you can overcome the habit. Right, which is very difficult, right? Yeah, it's very difficult to change a bad habit because, first of all, if you are not aware about having that habit, right, right. it's obviously very difficult to correct something that you don't know, you know, what it is. Uh, but uh, also really correcting a habit is a huge amount of work, right? It requires a lot of Yeah, and, and, and he talked about um, bringing the habits to a level so that they were conscious. Right, Be, yeah. because if if it's if it's happening unconsciously, you can't do anything about right. it. So, so a lot of the work really is how you pay attention. So yeah. um, we have our our, our um, the whole system that we have um, is designed to allow us to move easily yes. um, in a gravitational field. You know, we're yeah. we're designed to be upright. It's taken many thousands of years of evolution, but that is built into our systems. Yes. And if we can learn not to interfere with it, <laughs> it will do its job beautifully. Right, and, yes. And, and so not interfering, um, some of it for pianists uh, means learning how to sit. I mean, that may sound really strange. Well yeah, that, but that's the first thing I teach to my students, how to sit yeah. at the piano. Probably they need a foot bench because if you're a child, right. you know, you really need uh, your uh, feet 
support it right on the ground uh, you know to say the high but for example the fact that uh, here in the states they don't use that much the adjustable benches oh, totally. yeah, always are horrible to me because it was like no yes we need the adjustable benches because that position of your body and the height of your uh, you know arms and then how you go uh, from your arms to your fingers that's so important you cannot sit so low you know with this kind of you know well, absolutely benches absolutely. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, people like Glenn Gould, who used to sit way low, you know, some people think that's the way you should play. Um, <laughs> it was good for him, maybe, but, you know. Um, so, so, you know, the, an adjustable bench is very important. I yeah. find that a wooden stool is, the, is my favorite bench because your body needs to feel the support. If you're on right. a cushion, it yeah. kind of can't really sense it yeah. as easily. Right. Um, so, I mean, I make my students sit on their hands. If you sit on your hands, um, you can really feel the bones that you're sitting on. And, you know, if, if a lot of students uh, tend, tend up kind of sitting with their pelvis tipped back, so they're kind of sitting on their tailbone. Right. Yes. You know? So if you can get them to sit on their hands and kind of uh, roll up over their sitting bones, and then they can actually feel that, yeah. oh, got a, a very strong structure here to help me sit yeah um you know that that's that's a very important thing and and and, and really having your feet flat on the floor feeling yes. your heels on the floor yes not, <laughs> not wearing high heels um you know flat shoes is very important to give your system the support that it right. needs so that it can move easily Right, 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 right. Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know if you have noticed that I don't wear high heels when I play, right? That's right. the reason, right? Because I really want to feel, you know, my kind yeah. of fit on the ground. I want to be stable on the ground. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I think in terms of, um, you know, pianists may not think this way, but I, I almost think that when I perform um, and when I'm learning how to play a piece, I'm I'm actually choreographing it. Right, it's, it's like a dancer, right? I, the, there's yeah. always a, what I say to my students. It's like a, you are dancing on the piano, right? You are kind of uh, coordinating your fingers in a certain way that they move, uh, you know, on the piano, and that should be natural. I, I don't know if you know that kind of technique. It's a, a technique which has been developed in Israel, and it's called the Lady Ga uh, Lady Gaga. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Gaga people, sorry. It's called Gaga people, and it is about really control and non-control of the movements. It oh. seems like uh, many dancers improve improve much faster if they realize when they are controlling the movements, where and when they are not controlling the movements. So if the movement is, uh, you know, like this, uncontrolled, you know, it's free, or yeah. it is really kind of uh, intentional. And so, and it seems like they apply that to dance therapy and to Parkinson's disease mm. as a form of, you know, learning how to control your body. But I think that applies to mentally, you know, at least in the way that we think and in the way that we play piano. Sometimes the movements are intentional. Sometimes they kind of derive from uh, uh, the movement of your arm, the movement of your wrist, or kind of, you know, how you are really kind of, uh, uh, coordinating right and left, and and not so much from you know the single notes that you're playing, right? Right. I mean, as as a pianist, I encourage people um, to think about allowing. I mean, that that's the thing about the Alexander work is is if you allow something to happen naturally, yes. Um, then it's going to your 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 tone is going to be much richer. You're going to have right. much less tension doing it. And, and so an example of that is just what, when you play, allowing gravity to help you. Right. You know, don't yeah. fight against the gravity, right? Yes. Um, so so it's, it's something you have to really practice. Um, yes. That's why I say being aware. It's like one of the things that um, takes a little bit of time is <clears throat> we're designed so that um, we can stay, we can monitor how we're how we're moving and how and and um our our, our contact with our environment so right. so um we can do that while we do something so so as an example 
while I'm talking to you right now, I can also keep my attention on my contact with the floor and the bench while yeah. I'm talking to you. Um, yes. and, and so you, you can, when you begin to practice that way so that you include that in, in your practice, then when you're performing, um, you can become aware of tension anywhere yes. uh, in your body. And yeah. while you're performing, the, the, the thing about the Alexander work is that it's a, uh, a work of intention, paying attention and intention. So if yeah. I'm playing and I notice tension somewhere in my body, I don't do anything about it other than having the intention to let go of that tension. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's very, very similar to what you do when you do yoga, right? Or meditation and that kind of work, right? Because when we, when you meditate or you do that kind of relaxation kind of uh, uh, techniques, so you apply that to your body, you're basically focusing on one part of the body at the time while uh, maybe listening to, you know, somebody uh, guiding the meditation or not thinking uh, thoughts, right? Which is already kind of intentional, you know, seeing the thoughts, you know, flying, uh, as you know, as the, there are clouds passing uh, over your mind. So that, that's an intentional kind of work that you're Absolutely. relaxing. You're there's a, yeah. There's a, a practice that anybody can do. Um, there's a video by a teacher in San Diego uh, and she calls it constructive rest. Her name is Eileen Trubberman, but I, I often will share it with people. It's something that you can give me the link. I will post that in the description okay. of the video. <laughs> uh, it's something that you can do. It takes like five, 10 minutes. And, yes. and it's just you tuning into your body and your thinking, and you're focusing your attention on anywhere that you notice tension in your body. Now, now you, you lie down in a certain way with your knees up and, and a support for your head, and, and she can kind of explain how that works. Okay. Um, and as you do this over time, your body learns to let go of that tension because what, when you're lying and you're fully supported, there's no reason for you to keep holding on to the tension in your neck right. and, your back and, and your shoulder and, and right. where so you, you fill the contact really with the ground, right? And that right. kind of thing. So it's kind of a, it's a similar to yoga nidra, right? Uh, so when you do yoga nidra, that you can kind of lay down, right. and you have, basically you have to relax without falling asleep. That's a goal. <laughs> right. right. And, and so, so you become good at noticing where the tension is, yeah. and and just having the intention of letting it go. Um, and as you practice that over time you can apply it to when you're standing up or when you're playing piano or doing right, anything. Right, right. You know, the, yes. the Alexander work is really, um, it's a foundational kind of a work. So I, I, I it helps me do my yoga. It, it helps yeah. me live my life, you know, because the reality is that whatever, however you're going about your, your life, uh, whether you're sitting at a computer or driving your car, if mm -hmm. you're doing it in a conscious way, then you can learn to let go of unnecessary tension. Yes. If you're doing it in an unconscious way, you're just reinforcing right. all of that tension. Yes. So, so, so it's a choice. It's a choice that we have. Yeah. So I, I've noticed when, when I uh, kind of started really meditating regularly, I've noticed that even when I was playing, because I was training to stay in the moment, right? To focus in the moment, just like don't let, let the thoughts, you know, go somewhere else. So I really could notice a huge difference in the way, in my mental kind of state while I was performing, right? Because I, we tend to, uh, you know, get distracted maybe, or kind of think, uh, oh, my um, helps a lot, right? In that, and really kind of staying in that space. Uh, right, because in if, that moment. if you give, so, so, um, we all have, um, um, I don't know, we have, a, we have an inner voice that uh, <laughs> can, can either be helpful or it can destructive. You know, be destructive. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what to even call it, but it's, it's there. Yeah. Um, it's a part of our thinking that yes. helps us. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of an analytical, critical 
kind of thinking that, that can help us to learn. Um, when we're performing, um, we need to just find a way to give that part of our, our, our thinking something constructive to do. Yes. Um, otherwise, it could sabotage us. Yep. So, so um, we know that well. <laughs> right. So some of the things that that you can have it do is while you're playing is you can give it a job. Say, um, I want you to to make sure to monitor my breathing. I want you to let me know if there's any tension somewhere that I can let go of. I want you to keep me aware of the audience. You know, so so you give it specific jobs uh, yes. while you're performing, and 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 again, it takes practice. Right. Um, but eventually, it it has enough to do so that you can focus on on the performance. And 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 the other thing that I often will 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 do intentionally is I will focus it on exactly what kind of sound do I want to get for every single note that I'm playing. Because right. it's really immersed in that kind of listening. Yes. And it's it's not going to distract you with some other things going on. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so I remember that the, the moment that I gave to that voice the job to of um, really kind of staying focused on, you know, whatever I was doing at the piano, especially when I was reading the score, right? Uh, so and instead of getting distracted from that, you know, just like stay focused on just that, I, it, it was like a, almost like playing for the first time, right? right. Uh, in that way, because I was always kind of, you know, playing, yes, but, you know, uh, was distracted from my own kind of thoughts, which was not, not really good and not, not right. useful well, it's, at, it's, at all. I mean, it's a... Um... It's a practice for sure, and um, when when you're able to get into um, uh, a totally immersed state, um, there there's nothing like it <clears throat> in the world. It's 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 just a, a um, an incredibly wonderful experience for the performer and the audience. Yes, um, and <clears throat> and in order to kind of get to that place. Um, you really have to quiet that voice, you know, and 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 uh, it, it does take practice. And you know, some days, you know, if I'm if I'm well rested, I have a much better chance uh, yes. of that happening. But if I've been running myself ragged, uh, and then I try, it, it it takes a certain amount of energy to be able to kind of be that present. And and, and so. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a gift when it happens, but it, it, it's also something you can practice, and yes. and you can you can kind of learn um, how much rest do you need uh, to give yourself if you really want to have a chance of, of having one of those special performances. You have to really plan to yes. your schedule down, and you know, give yourself you know enough time to 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 wrap, relax and to go out in nature and, and do things like that, to kind of get into that space that will- yeah, It seems out. like we don't really we don't really uh, think about that. We think, okay, so I have so much time until the performance this evening at seven, right? And then I can do whatever, right? With my day, I can work normally and uh, then I go there and play. That's not, that doesn't happen that way because especially if you have uh, a solo performance, right? Or even an accompanying performance or whatever performance uh, you have, that day is performance day. So that day has to be planned in advance. The preparation to that day, up to that day, is like almost prepared for a wedding. You know, you have to have this, 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 this first. And then that day you have to plan. Uh, I mean, uh, usually, I don't know, take a bath, go out for a walk, practice a certain amount of hours, no longer than that, right? Yeah. Because I don't want yeah. to get tired. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. then uh, and then meditate and then relax, so then prepare myself and just go, right? Then yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. kind of yeah. my I, sort I of routine for that day, mm -hmm. yes. It's important for people to find what works for them. Um, yeah. You know, family drama, I, I love my family, but, you know, and or friends that are, we all have those people in our lives. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you, you want to stay away from them, uh, you know. 
Again, especially especially uh, before a performance because then you get there and you can perform right they will, yeah. they will get in your head and and that's not going to help help you no. right 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 yes sure. yeah yeah so how would you um i mean if somebody would be interested in uh, um really applying the Alexander technique to their playing and starting, you know, the, from, from the, they would need to start from the beginning. So they would have to start from their kind of uh, body, you know, just awareness about, you know, tension and uh, how to sit at the piano, how to put the weight on, you know, their fingers, how to move. And, and then how, how does it, you know, how do you apply that uh, regularly to, <clears throat> So, I mean, I would say, um, you know, the first thing that they could do is that lying down exercise. And yes. I'll send you that link. Do you, I mean, do yes, you want me to do yes. that now or, or after? I guess I could do No, that. after, after. I can, I can add it after. So, yes. I'll send you that link. Um, there are some really wonderful videos online that mm -hmm. people can be helpful. Um, finding a workshop uh, in your area that, that yeah. offers it would, would, would really help. I know a lot of teachers too are doing online lessons now. So, I mean, some of the, the best teachers I've studied with are in Boston. And I know a number of them do yeah. uh, even, even lessons on the internet. So, I mean, I prefer working with people in person right. uh, just because it's a much richer experience. Right, and you keep uh, you can give a personal feedback right away, right? Did you see exactly. different, yeah. Exactly. Um, but but mostly it's um, it's a it's a commitment to really um, wanting to learn how to um, become aware of the, the quality of of your life pretty much the quality of, yeah. of how how you're thinking about your life how you know it, it's really raising your um, your, your thinking. So that mm -hmm. you become aware of um, really basic ways that that you're that you're living your life, right? And, and you 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 the, the good thing about the work is that you're in charge. You know, I mean, you have a choice. <clears throat> that was that was what I loved about it is that <clears throat> I could decide to do this, and nobody else was responsible for it but me. Right. So yes. very empowering. Yes. Uh, so uh, at times, at times we think we cannot change that habit because of, oh, we are that way. Oh, I am a tense person. I'm an anxious person. Well, you know, yeah, now, but you can still decide to, you know, become a different and work yeah. on yourself, and then you know, adjust those things in order to have a better life. I, I, I can decide the, my reactions to certain things. Right. Yeah. So and then uh, how I decide, uh, I don't know, I had students, oh, but I, I'm very tense. Well, OK, good. Then learn how to relax. You know, very tense. Good. It's right. fine. Right now it's fine. Just uh, learn how to relax uh, your arm. Right. So let's do some exercises. And then over time, if you apply that regularly and uh, consistently to yourself and you are really serious about you know, noticing something that, uh, you know, notice your mistakes, noticing what you're doing and trying to correct that. It's just like, a, I think a, um, it's just always a decision that we, you know, uh, make, right? Oh, how do I want to be? How do I want to become? What do I want out of that? Right. We, we want to go from um, unconscious to conscious or, or, right. or impulsive to having a choice. Or I would say, um, I, have, uh, I was researching for one of the videos of, on this channel and uh, I was listening to a podcast uh, by Andrew Huberman and um, he's a professor at Stanford University and he was talking about how uh, certain things uh, can become so certain things that we do intentionally can become um, reflexive at one point after we do that for a certain number of times. So if we really learn intentionally to relax, right? After a while, our brain kind of uh, uh, would just like push this information down to the back part of our brain and this will become reflexive. So it will become like uh, breathing, right? For us or walking. So we don't think about that, right? Yeah. 
I mean, that's that's I mean, I I totally agree. And I think that's why this work is very powerful, because if you I mean, just as you can reinforce habits that are not going to help you, you can also develop new ones that are going to help you. Right. <clears throat> um, um, one of the. Um, I, I guess one of the things that people can do is just it's a very basic thing is. And I know from myself that I it took me a while to, to learn this, but when you're playing, becoming aware of whether or not you're holding your breath. That you can yes. just that's just a very simple thing to do, right? Yeah, but but to learn how to do that um, while you're playing takes practice. So right. once you develop the skill to monitor your breathing while you're playing, then it'll happen without right. you having to think about it. And then you can kind of focus on something else. Yes, of course, yes. So we forget, right? So, I mean, uh, you play a 30 minute sonata and then uh, yeah, you, you haven't taken a breath for the entire 30 minutes. So you're obviously as stressed after that, right? You're not relaxed. Well, I, but even I encourage the kind of students, um, any instrumentalist, mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess to use breath marks, right? Uh, like, uh, like you do. on their score, exactly. Right, right. But I, even uh, so, for example, when um, I usually, well, I started with uh, Lola Tabor, who is uh, um, a Jewish pianist. So she's uh, she lives in Switzerland. I think she's ninety five by now, uh, but uh, she taught me all these techniques, and she taught me how you can take a breath with your wrist, for example, or take your breath while playing, you know, by relaxing in that moment. Like if you have a played, I don't know, um, two lines of broken octaves, and they are very, very fast. And obviously your arm is going to get, you know, be not relaxed at the end of that. But if you take a breath and you take a kind of a, you just like, you know, use a circular motion just to relax at that moment. Yeah. And then you plan that ahead. It's not that, yeah. um, you know, at first it is intentional, obviously. You know, I plan all the movements so that I know exactly where to move the wrist, how yeah. to move the wrist, how to relax it, and how to do that in a way that doesn't affect the sound quality, right, of uh, the piece. Absolutely. Then it gives you, that feeling that uh, you are playing naturally and then you're kind of dancing on the piano and then you're kind of relaxing uh, at certain points and then you can continue, right? You can play right. something else and yeah. you can continue. Right, and you plan these moments of tensions, tension and relaxation. Yeah. Um, you plan ahead. And then, and then she always t told us uh, that, that thing that I couldn't really grasp, uh, you know, right away. <laughs> it was like, you have to look for the truth in the piece, which is like, uh, so the piece is planned in a certain way that has to be, you know, it has to come natural. Again, you know, it doesn't have to be a forced thing that you're doing just because the composer has written it. If Chopin has written uh, a jump from one note to the other one, that means also that he, he gives you the time to do that kind of movement, right? It's not that it was kind of a, somebody who wanted to torture pianists and say, oh, okay, you have to do that. <laughs> you have to do it in a certain way, right? And then you have to, uh, injure yourself by doing that. So no, no it's yeah, a way I that, think, yeah. It's exactly true. And um, because of how the piano is designed, um, as soon as the uh, hammer hits the string, right. you can let go of any tension that, that you had to produce that tone. Right. And, and so it's, it's constantly intentionally letting go you know, while while you're playing, and, and as you say, giving yourself um, those breaths or 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 you know just natural kind of pauses to allow your system to kind of get back to neutral, right? right? Yes. Because um, I mean, getting back to neutral is kind of a funny idea, um, but just think about um, if you can. If you can, um, neutral to me means well-balanced and it's the ability to be able to move in any direction right. at any time. Yes. If you're overcommitted, if you're, um, you know, too, um, uh, um, uh, 
don't even know how, what what the words are. But but you you can be overcommitted, and and then that can accumulate the tension. Yeah, I always say to my students in this regard, I say when 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 you walk. Do you really press on the ground, like intentionally press on the ground? Is there a need to press on the ground? No, because you're naturally staying on your feet and you're walking, you're moving, uh, you know, the weight from one foot to the other foot naturally. So that's the same way that you don't really need to overpress a key after you apply that, it's a natural weight of your arm. And each arm has a different weight. So my sound is different than your sound, right? So, you know, if you're a tiny girl, you, don't need to have my own sound. You have your natural weight on the key. So and it's kind of a, a, it's funny because I really teach my students really kind of to walk literally on two fingers like that, you know, walk inside the keyboard, outside the keyboard, and learn kind of how to really kind of feel like, a, oh, this is a, a tiny human being and it's t walking in and back. And this is kind of a way that, uh, you know, uh, you can learn how to really kind of. Uh, feel the weight on your fingers instead of just like moving the fingers uh, in a kind of you know uh, artificial way let's say that because it's not so natural then well yeah. i mean another another thing that's important is that people understand the design of, of our bodies yeah. the, the 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 muscular uh, skeletal design. you know you, you always kind of uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, the, the, i don't know if this is uh, you know uh, an alexander technique uh, thing but uh the teacher I studied with, Laura Tavro, then she always said, you know, this is kind of very unnatural way of moving the fingers because you are just moving this thing. And that's not the natural way that you, this is the natural way. So we are kind of supposed to use the fingers to, or our hand to take things. So when you play, this is more natural than just moving up right. and down the fingers. So, um, so I mean, some people, so, so for me, the, the, the things that were really important for me to understand, first of all, when I say how to sit, um, is where the hip joints are. Yes. Um, a, a lot of people don't have a clue. I didn't have a clue for most of my life. <laughs> and, you know, um, the hip joints are really important because that's where the torso can move freely. So if you get a good sense of your hip joints, Right. which are kind of in, in your groin area, I would say, is, is yeah. maybe people might understand. So it's you, you've got the top of your thigh bones. You can kind of feel that. Right. And then the, the, there's another piece of bone that goes up and in that has a socket that goes into your hip joints. Right. So, so kind of learning and actually moving, because when we move, we want to move from where our joints are. Yes. Now, that's how we're designed. <laughs> Um, and, and so, so really getting a good sense of where your hip joints are is, is really important. Uh, another thing that's really important is how the arms are designed. And the arms um, actually begin and, and, and connect to your skeletal system at two points. Mm -hmm. They're at your, your sternum. So right. we've got a joint here. Yeah. That is part of our arm, and your shoulder blade does not connect to any bone; it floats. Right. And so, so when you move your arm, you want to allow your entire arm to move. Right. I, mean, I, I used to play, and I, I thought my shoulder started here, and I used to keep my. You yeah, know, you stay like this, right? Like <laughs> tied there, right? Yes. Yeah. And as soon as you relax this part, as soon as you relax yeah, this I mean, part, everything yeah. is better, right? I mean, know that the you know that the the arms start here and the movement is from here, and the shoulder blades float, right. and 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 you know that gives you a tremendous amount of freedom. Yes. You know, so so when I play, I, I'm really it's it's a whole body movement always. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can I can feel the floor under my feet, and and mm -hmm. and it's it's a you know whatever sound, the, the thing that 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 I focus on is the quality of the sound, and then I trust that if I don't interfere with my system and I'm really listening carefully, it will figure out how yes. to sound. And on every piano, it's going to be different, right? You yes. know, so you've got to really develop the ability to listen carefully and, and, and trust that your system will know how to do it. You can't 
try to micromanage the parts. I mean, I had a teacher who wanted me to think about every joint <laughs> and she drove me crazy and I quit playing piano for a while. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't sit at the piano without having her voice in my head about this. <laughs> and you just can't possibly right. play the piano and try to micromanage every Join Every it. single thing, yeah, it has to be really kind of a very, very natural. I, yeah, I had, yeah, uh, kind of a, I had a, a few experiences uh, uh, with, uh, in some competitions, I saw uh, quite a few students uh, coming from the same uh, teacher, and they were always uh, so all the, the these students were playing the same piece over time, right? So they were playing the same piece, these students were making exactly the same movements artificial movements, which were not, you know, uh, were not, um, like, uh, uh, were not useful to the piece, let's say. <laughs> and I was like, uh, why is this happening? Why are these kids playing uh, this note like this, and then moving the hand like that, and then moving this other hand like that? And they were all really micromanaged, you know, to do these movements in that sequence for that specific piece and that's very unnatural and then damaging to the students as well because they're not learning uh, their own natural way to move and to kind of produce the sound there are certain things that you can do right obviously the way that you connect one sound to the other one right so like uh, instead of just jumping from one sound and it's just usually your fingers uh, you walk on the sound, right? So you just like walk over to that sound. That sound is kind of not the main beat of the major. So you play that in a different way with using a different movement, right? And, and all those things. But that's something that you understand slowly and then you apply that by yourself, right? Without kind of being forced by an external source of uh, thoughts, right? I guess um, so, um, just kind of getting back to some other things that people can do. I mean, one of the things that um, really was very detrimental to me is that when I was a young kid, I wanted to be a strong muscle man. You know, I, I, I had this idea that somehow that made you more masculine. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in high school, you know, I wanted the girls to like me. So, so I, I got in a habit of working out really intensely for many years, for, for maybe uh, 20 years of my life. And so I had developed, my muscles were, were overdeveloped and, and, right. and so my whole system really couldn't work as a unit very well because, you know, I, I had just artificially kind of bulked up all of these different muscles. And, and so that definitely got in the way, not only of, not only of my piano playing, but in, 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 in the way of my breathing, yes. you know, I mean, uh, it interferes with just about everything. So, so I um, switched going to the gym for, for learning yoga. Yeah. Now you have to be very careful with yoga um, because in, in our country, Unfortunately, uh, because we're so competitive, we've turned yoga into a competitive sport. <laughs> yes, and it's a sport thing, right? Yes. You can really hurt yourself uh, depending on who your teachers are. Um, I mean, I, the same, I same, same with the piano, right? So, right. A piano cannot be a competition. You, you know, kind of has stopped for a while sending my students to competitions because it's just a not that it is self-development you develop yourself and you cannot compete with anybody else but with yourself like you are exactly. just better than i had my son tell me mom today uh, so he was practicing the piano today i learned that one measure really well so i'm still doing better than yesterday right i was like awesome yes <laughs> so that's that's i think the attitude that students should have yeah i'm better than yesterday i can do this better i improved that one part i improved you know, really being relaxed on the piano and not, yeah. you know, not competing with me, you, and anybody else because it's useless. Yeah, I mean, it's important to um, to really be compassionate for yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, and and it's natural to want to compare yourself to somebody else. Um, right. And we have a culture that encourages it, yeah. uh, unfortunately. But um, but this is the world we're in. And so as a practice, um, you know, as you say, 
it's about you striving to overcome your limitations. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody else has their own life journey and their own issues. And, and so, you know, just to, to stay focused on how can I do my best is, right. is really yes. important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. I, I mean, uh, uh, a few years ago, I would have never imagined to be on YouTube live uh, and do a live stream. First of all, you know, I had to learn English better because sure. I couldn't trust myself, right, to speak in English uh, in, a, or in front of a camera. Um, and uh, my accent, you know, was horrified, like, oh, no, people are going to hate me for that. And uh, and then obviously, you know, being on the camera is different. And then you have really kind of to say, OK, good. Uh, they can say whatever, but I'm trying, you know, to overcome my own fears, my own uh, uh, limitations. Uh, and then the same for piano, for piano playing. I, you know, I have a lot of uh, adults, uh, adult students who maybe are afraid of performing for others, uh, afraid of, uh, you know, not being enough, uh, not being good enough, not being uh, as talented as, you know, that, or kind of being too old for, right? You know, there are all those limitations that we put to ourselves, and then that that is damaging because we can still improve. So we are kind of, we have room for improvement until we die, <laughs> right? So. Absolutely. I mean, I, I guess um, what I would say um, the Alexander technique has kind of taught me is to just stay open to life. So <clears throat> what I mean by that is we can't control what happens in our life. Right. Um, we can control, we have a choice in how we respond to what happens. Yes. And I can respond from a place of fear or from a place of being open and, mm -hmm. and not afraid. And yeah. if I respond from a place of fear, I'm gonna make myself smaller. Right. And what that means is more tension in my body. Right. If I can choose not to do that and stay open and not be afraid, um, then I'm able to experience whatever life has decided I need to experience, right? Be because that's why it's happening. Right, yes, um, yeah. You know, there's something here for me to learn. Yeah, and there's always a lesson, right? I, I think I, I think there's something in, in a yoga philosophy that they say, okay, what happens to you is a lesson that you have to learn if I, in if your I life. If I lose myself to it, I'm not gonna learn it. Right, yes. Right? And, and so, so being open really means, um, allowing yourself to experience what's going on with all of your senses right and and, and really being present to what's going on yeah it is really kind of a, a, a i think a, um a mentality of acceptance uh of the reality okay so that's a reality that i cannot change right what the only thing i can control in this moment is how i am interacting with this reality and how I am experiencing this reality. So when we experience things as a lesson to learn or as, you know, something that I can still improve about myself, okay, I can take advantage of that and become better in this, right? Uh, I can turn this negative uh, um, experience into something that is positive for me, right? In the future, or kind of, I, I'm learning a lesson, I'm teaching that, that lesson to somebody else. So that's the kind of, I think that, that the thing that, um, you know, all those kind of uh, techniques and philosophies uh, uh, teach us. Um, and uh, we, it, we judge everything. And, and actually <clears throat> life is, is not, there's, there's, um, it just is what it is. And, you know, judging it is kind of silly. Yeah. If you think about it. Judging it is just based on your past experience. Right. Uh, yes. One of the problems I think with, um, with our society is that um, we have this idea that human, human beings are somehow um, the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the reality. 
you know, if, if the human race was wiped off this planet, the planet would thrive without yes. us. And, <laughs> Probably. And we make such a big deal about some of these little things. It's, it's, it's really losing that perspective. You know, I mean, the sun comes up every day, right? The, 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 there's no collisions happening. In we don't control that. No, right. right. <laughs> but, you know, if something doesn't go the way we want, then there's something wrong with the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's really silly. Uh, kind yes. Of yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a matter of really kind of uh, having our ego always, uh, you know, over there and then saying, oh, I have to, or they are judging me for, or they, and it's a, it, it's, I think it is cultural. You know, we are taught to do that. We are taught to really kind of feel all this kind of uh, feelings and discomfort when something happened and but we can also unlearn it right exactly. and uh, exactly. then how to control that and do that uh, in a different way which is difficult you know i'm still learning it but yes. um yeah. well, i mean i i think that's you know that's why we're here is is to right. learn and evolve yes yeah 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 um okay so how uh what would you suggest, uh, you know, um, so as a final thought, what would, would you suggest if somebody is really interested in to Alexander Technique besides taking workshops and then, uh, so are there resources that they can use, like, uh, you know, besides videos and things like that, like readings? Uh, um, I mean, a lot, a lot of people have written a lot of books on it. I mean, the, the, the because of the internet, um, this, this stuff is very, uh, available that, to people that are interested in it. Um, what would it, I mean, I, I guess um, I would encourage them to do that lying down uh, mm -hmm. exercise that I'll share with you. Yes. Um, what other? I mean, they could, you know, like begin to practice awareness of, you know, just simple things like like breathing. Learning yes. how to sit well is a big is a big thing. You know, sitting and standing. I mean, pianists don't really stand uh, like other performers do, but but learning to sit sit is a is a big deal. Yes. Um, and so, you know, consciously applying those things while they practice, be, because if you don't, you're just reinforcing something that's not helping you. And so, and right. so, making a conscious decision to learn how to sit well. You know how to how to monitor your breathing while you're playing, while you're cooking, while you're you know driving. You yes. know, because breathing is really important. Yes. Um, and really, you know, I mean, it goes to all across your life, right? You want to you want to be conscious of of what you're right. eating. You know, is it healthy for me? Um, yeah. Am I getting enough rest? Am I getting enough exercise? And, and as you do those things, doing them with an awareness of, of, of the quality, um, you know, that, 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 that you're doing them so that a lot of times you can say, I'm going to just practice another three hours and end up making things much worse. Yeah. <laughs> the way that you're practicing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, how would you prepare like a, uh, for a performance, a very quickly, like uh, how would you plan the uh, preparation for a performance uh, if you would just like, uh, if, if you're going to perform uh, and the, what, what what are the thoughts that, uh, you know, what would you suggest to do, you know, in preparation of this kind of? Well, um, there are a lot of things that I do. Um, first of all, is really thinking about a performance as a marathon. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's kind of how I approach yeah. it. And what I mean by that is, first of all, making sure that a month before I'm going to perform in public, the music is is learned and memorized, and 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 you know, it, there's yeah. not I'm not going to have to be practicing a lot to right. get to where I want it to be. Right. Um, and then um, doing a lot of practicing of performing when mm -hmm. I practice. So a lot of run through. Yeah, many many people don't do that, right? So like practicing the performance, like as right. if you are in the performance, like you are an actor on the stage, right? So you perform exactly. that. When you're on the stage. You're not going to stop. You're not going to fix things. So just getting getting a lot of practice of playing it all the way through, regardless of what happens. Mm -hmm. 
you know, finding where the, the spots are that you need to, to spend more time, you know, and just being really focused about where, where things are and what, you know, what you need to pay a little bit more attention to. And then the week before the performance, getting as much rest as I can, you know, mm-hmm. shifting my schedule around so that, you know, the day of the performance, I've got a very light schedule. The day before this, the performance is, is not too heavy. Yes. Um, and, the, the, you know, eating really well, uh, sleeping really as much as I can, and, and not overdoing it. it the, the week of the performance, not playing a lot. You know, uh, maybe playing slowly, um, looking at the music just to kind of remind myself of things, but but really giving my system a a, a rest so yes. that in the performance I can be really fresh. Right. And and I guess the day of the performance, um, <clears throat> having a meal, uh, a, a, I, I like to have a meal with a lot of carbs, mm-hmm. maybe you know four hours or, or three hours ahead. So that when I'm on stage, my system is not digesting food, and I've got plenty of fuel in the tank. Yeah. Um, I, I like to, I mean, make sure you're well hydrated. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't drink caffeine. I mean, don't don't do anything that you don't normally do, you know, yeah. before you get out on stage. So so you want to really practice and have a routine very well established. Uh, about 20 minutes before I, I go on stage, I like to do a physical warm up, um, you know, just gentle stretching, um, yeah. make sure everything is loose. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I'll do um, some kind of a mental preparation, just uh, meditation right. um, to just kind of quiet my mind. <clears throat> I'll do a, maybe a little bit of emotional work, kind of bringing up memories to kind of get the emotions up to the surface, you know, all mm-hmm. kinds of emotions, because you want that to be available to your performance. Right. And then once you kind of have your system, you know, you, you have to learn kind of when you're ready to go out. It's, it's a learning process. Yeah. Then what I like to do is something to just kind of stay in that state. And, and it, it could be simply just juggling one, you know, you don't have to be a juggler. <clears throat> but just juggling something, something that's I gonna that. <laughs> it's gonna engage both sides of your brain. Something that you can do that's just gonna kind of keep you in that place. Right. Um, yeah, I guess one other thing that I'll do is if <clears throat> if I'm feeling a little bit low energy, I want to like get my energy level up. So I'll do jumping jacks or yeah. you know, jogging or or something yeah. because you want your heart rate to be where it's going to be when you're on stage. You don't want that to be a surprise. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, and so when you're practicing performing, you want to get your heart rate up there so yeah. that you can learn how to play when your system is, is ramped, is, is, is amped up. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. So I will uh, post uh, some links uh, below in the description. Uh, so your own, uh, you know, uh, your contact information, just in case somebody would like to get in touch with you. And then uh, the links to the videos that you were talking about. Uh, um, and uh, thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> um, and for all this useful information. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been my pleasure, Antonella. Thank you for doing <laughs> I hope it helps people. I hope to. Bye. Thank you.